Hi Year 12, uh, this is another video uh, on religious experiences. Um, uh, this time I'm looking at mystical experiences. So the, one of the essays that um, is in your list of essays you could write is this, mystical experiences tell us nothing about the existence of God. Discuss. Now, we have done all the content you'll need for, for mystical experiences, but we haven't really talked directly about the term and about um, examples of it, I suppose. So I'm going to say a little bit about myst mystical experiences in general first, and then um, I'm going to talk about the essay. So, um, But before that, I'm actually going to talk about a, a novel by a writer called Stephen King, just to give us a bit of an introduction. So, um, so there's a picture of Stephen King. Stephen King, obviously one of the most famous authors in the world, one of the high, biggest selling authors in the world, famous for writing horror, novels most famously things like it and carrie and um the shining i guess those most famous uh, books however uh stephen king has also written books that don't really fall so squarely into the horror genre and one of them and one of his best loved collections of books is of stories is this different seasons which you can see on the screen different seasons is a collection of four novellas novellas are like short novels and they these four novellas each one focuses on a different season of the year. That's the way the, the that's the kind of um, basis of the book. But they're all about completely different things. Now, interestingly, uh, f three of those novellas have been turned into films, and and two of them into very very successful films. So one of the not novellas in that book is the Shawshank Redemption, which you may have seen. Um, another of the novellas is called The Body, and that's what I'm going to talk about. So The Body was made into the film called uh, Stand By Me, which is really an 80s classic. You can see the poster there. You may have seen it. If you haven't, I recommend you've seen it. It's a fantastic novella and a fantastic no uh, film as well. The Body is about uh, four teenage boys. They're like about maybe uh, 13, that kind of age, who go to look for... They've heard... It's set in like the 50s or something. A long time ago, anyway. It, it's uh, They've heard that there's a dead body in the woods near where they live. That someone died I know, hit by a train or something he didn't he wasn't killed he just died and they want to go and see the body before it's kind of collected and taken away so they just out of curiosity so the four of them uh, sp spend like a couple of days trekking through the woods to go and look look at this dead body and the, the, the story is really about the kind of relationship between the the, 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 the friends and the kind of uh, yeah the, kind of a growing up kind of story amongst those friends now the reason I'm talking about it here is because of something that happens in the story. So the main um, guy in the story is called, well, what's he called? Oh, I can't remember what it's called. Um, Georgie, maybe? I can't remember. Anyway, they, it's told from this guy's point of view. And at one point in the story, they, they've camped out overnight on their journey, and he goes off while the others are still asleep to go to the toilet and he goes to the toilet and he comes back and while he is coming back he sees a deer and I'm going to read the part from the story where he reads a deer so hold on let me just find it so uh so he sits there um he's sitting there he's kind of walked gone to the toilet and he's coming back he's not in a hurry to come back to join his friends he just wants to spend a bit of time wandering on his own so it, and so he sits down looking at the landscape and he says this i don't know how long i sat there on the rail he's sitting on some kind of rail uh watching the purple steal out of the sky as noiselessly as it had stolen in the evening before long enough to for my butt to start complaining anyway i was about to get up when i looked to my right and saw a deer standing in the railroad bed not 10 yards from me my heart went up into my throat so high that i think i could have put my hand in my mouth and touched it my stomach was filled with a hot, dry excitement. I didn't move. I couldn't have moved if I wanted to. Her eyes weren't brown, but a dark, dusty black, the kind of velvet you see background in jewellery displays. Her small ears were scuffed suede. She looked serenely at me, head slightly lowered, in what I took for curiosity, seeing a kid with his hair in a sleep scarecrow of swirls and many timed cowlicks wearing jeans with cuffs and a brown khaki shirt with the elbows mended and the collar turned up in the hoodie tradition of the day 
what I was seeing was some sort of gift, something given with a carelessness that was appalling. We looked at each other for a long time. I think it was a long time. Then she turned and walked off to the other side of the tracks, white bobtail flipping insouciantly. She found grass and began to crop. That means eat the grass. I couldn't believe it. She had begun to crop. She didn't look back at me and, I, and didn't need to. I was frozen solid. Then the train started to thrum under my ass and bare seconds later the doe's head came up, cocked back towards Castle Rock. She stood there her branch black nose, working on the air, coaxing it a little. Then she was gone in three gangling leaps, vanishing into the woods, with no sound but one rotten, rotten branch, which broke with a sound like a track ref starter gun. I sat there looking mesmerised at the spot where she had been, until the actual sound of the freight came up through the stillness. Then I skidded back down the bank to where the others were sleeping. The freight's slow, loud passage woke them up, yawning and stretching. There was some funny, nervous talk about the case of the screaming ghost, as Chris called it. That was something from before. But not as much as you might imagine. In daylight, it seemed more foolish than interesting, almost embarrassing, best forgotten. It was on the tip of my tongue to tell them about the deer, but I, en but I ended up not doing so. That was one thing I kept to myself. I've never spoken or written of it until just now today and I have to tell you that it seems a lesser thing written down damn near inconsequential but for me it was the best part of that trip the cleanest part and it was a moment I found myself returning to almost helplessly when there was trouble in my life okay I've always, that, that part of the book always struck me as a strange part of the book because it's nothing to do with the rest of the story uh, which is all to do with the relationship between this, the characters in the book this kid just goes over, sees a deer, um, has that kind of weird experience, and then never speaks about it, and it's never mentioned for the rest of the book. Um, but what struck me when we, when I was kind of preparing this thing was that that is actually a, a kind of a mystical experience. And um, a lot of the features that kind of William James or um, uh, Rudolf Otto use when they talk about numerous experiences or mystical experiences are there in that thing. There's a sense that he can't put it into words. You know, at the end, he says when he wrote it down, it didn't seem, um, didn't seem very important, but it was very important to him. So he couldn't really put its importance into words. There was a sense of um, uh, kind of almost fear. He he talks about the the way that that gift was given. It's interesting phrases of words he uses to talk about a gift given in a in a um, what's that word he uses appallingly careless way strange use of words but again there's some kind of like fear there there's also a sense in which this in, this is a really important experience even though he can't put it into words doesn't really know why it's important he thinks it's really important and it's the best part of the trip for him uh it's the thing that he thought was the best thing that happened to them in this story which is very eventful and um it's something he comes back to again and again in his life when he's in trouble in life so what's interesting though is he doesn't mention god and that's going to be a theme we're going to come back to when we talk about mystical experiences about whether they actually do have anything to do with god or not this was a seemed to be a mystical experience by many standards but for some people mystical experiences to have to do with god and so for some they're not so let's get on to what mystical experiences are okay a mystical experience is the is the definition from our textbook so this is a good one to use a mystical experience is defined as an experience of something transcendent beyond normal awareness. So we know transcendent means beyond human understanding. Often it's also defined as outside space and time. So it's something kind of outside the normal realms of what we experience. That is one part of a definition, but it is a quite hard um, term to define, it should be said. Um, and it's also, you know, it's also worth saying that different terms are used. So mystical experience, when Otto refers to a numinous experience, that is another term, the numinous, a numinous experience for, uh, mystical experiences so that's the same thing here is another list of ideas that are commonly associated with mystical experiences so they cannot be described they're ineffable you can't put them into words they're a direct experience of absolute reality which is uncreated of an absolute reality sorry which is uncreated and beyond, beyond human knowledge so it's a it's a direct experience of some kind of truth which is beyond our knowledge usually 
it tells us something of ultimate importance. So these experiences are very, very important. You saw that with the experience of the deer. I should say Stephen King never talks about it being a mystical experience. That's just my interpretation. But it seemed interesting that it was of ultimate importance. It helps us understand who we really are and how we could live. So often they're life changing experience. It involves letting go of thought. So we're not really consciously thinking. It's like we're more passive in the situation. Passivity is one of the things that William James uses to define these experiences. We let go of us trying to control our thoughts and we just the experience just happens to us. We feel a sense of union with God or with absolute reality. So we're kind of there's almost a sense of being one with God. There is that does differ in different religious traditions. So, you know, in a Christian tradition, yes, a sense of being with God, but there's also a sense of being kind of God being greater and you being inferior. Whereas sometimes within the Hindu tradition, you get this sense of you becoming kind of merging in or becoming part of God, a much stronger sense of union. A sense of freedom, you know, uh, people fee feel somehow free when they have these experiences. A sense of being humble and be being in the presence of something greater than yourself. And that feeling of awe, remember awe means kind of amazement and fear combined. So it's a, a great experience, but it's also a terrifying experience. Okay, so that's a mystical experience. Here's a couple of examples, um, famous examples. Julian of Norwich is an example used by Rudolf Otto. Julian of Norwich was a, a female mystic, although she's called Julian, she was a woman, who lived in uh, the, from 1342 to 1416, so what's that, from the um, 14th to the 15th century, so mainly 14th century. Uh, yeah, female mystic who kind of lived as a nun and had many, many mystical experiences that she wrote down. Here's a quote from her. The whole creation, wondering and astonished, will have for God a dread so great and reverent and beyond anything known before that the very pillars of heaven will tremble and quake as they marvel at the greatness of God their maker and the insignificance of all that is made. So Julian of Norwich very much emphasizes this idea of feeling humble and in the presence of something great. Teresa of Avila, St. Teresa of Avila, a Catholic saint uh, from Spain. 1515 to 1582, so lived in the 16th century. I'll, I'll post on um, Teams a reading about centuries so you can have more information. But yeah, another person who had many, many mystical experiences, often when she was reading, so she said that when she was reading, they would come to her, and here's a quote, such a feeling of the presence of God that it has made it impossible for me to doubt that he was within me or that I was totally engulfed in him. So that sense of union with God was there in her experiences. Okay, let's get back to the essay. As always, I'm not going to go through everything that you should write. I'm just going to give some suggestions. One of the tough things is you've got to weave in Otto and James in here. And in some ways, Otto and James, well, especially Otto, doesn't really make an argument for the existence of God as such. He more talks about the nature of numerous experiences. So I'll talk about what you need to do with that. So mystical experiences tell us nothing about the existence of God. Well, we're going to start with Otto's numinous experiences. We're going to say that Otto describes numinous experiences as the heart of true religion. He does not make an argument say, saying that numinous experiences prove the existence of God, although obviously he clearly thinks so. So what we can do is we can use um, Swinburne. We can say, you know, using Swinburne, Otto says that religion is based on numinous experiences, and he describes what numinous experiences are like. You'll have to do that in, in your power. Using Swinburne, we can say, well, if people are having these numerous experiences, if people are feeling this sense of awe and wonder at something, if people are feeling a sense of um, uh, smallness compared to something really, really great, then, um, uh, you know, and people feeling something in the presence of something transcendent that's greater than their understanding and so on and so on, then... Um, According to Swinburne, we should believe what they say. So they they feel that they've been in the presence of some greater, higher power, some ultimate reality, which is natural to call God. Therefore, we should believe that they have been in the presence of that power. Um, how would you respond to that? Well, um, probably what's true is that, you know, Otto has picked up on something true, is that many, many people um, report having these numerous experiences. However, what he doesn't prove is that the numerous experiences come from God. And what I would talk about here is J.C.A. Gaskin. This was all, this is all in the in the video on Otto. 
But basically, uh, you could also have watched, and we watched in GCSE, that video of that atheist from America talking about numerous experiences. The Stephen King, uh, part of the Stephen King book kind of feeds into this too, which is that there are ways of explaining numerous experiences without reference to God. So J.C.A. Gaskin, although he believes in numerous experiences, he, he admits that you can find a category called, there is such a thing as a general numinous experience. In other words, it's possible to have a numinous experience which is not, uh, which you which can be explained without reference to God. Now, because numinous experiences can't be explained, you can go from what J.C. C. A. Gaskin says, there are non-religious numinous experiences, to the idea that, well, if we're talking about some experience that can't be put into words, how do we know that, that any of these numinous experiences come from God? Perhaps all numerous experiences can just be exp like emotional experiences of feeling awe and wonder, maybe at nature. You know, in the Stephen King kit story, we've got this feeling of just awe, of, of just being in the presence of this other creature, something like that. They feel of great significance. Um, they, they're, they're, um, they're very strong experiences, but they don't necessarily have anything to do with God. So that's the idea. Maybe the Stephen King heart is a hard one to use as an example, but you can talk about the, the fact that um, atheists, like the one we saw in that video, would use the example of looking at nature and to say, yes, we feel a sense of humbleness, a sense of awe, a sense of amazement, but that's just not to do with God, that's just to do with the, the mightiness of the natural world. Okay, then we come on to James. Now, James, again, with Otto and James, what you need to do is to build into these perils showing off that you know about their theories. So with James, you've got to talk before you get into his argument. So talk about, you know, the four characteristics that he says mystical experiences have and so on and so on. So you need to have a bit of background knowledge. That's your AO1, your knowledge section before you get into your evaluation. Once you've done that, you've got to talk about James's main argument is a pragmatic argument. So James does give us a bit more of an argument to believe in religious experiences. So his idea is that Mystical experiences, because remember, for James, all true religious experiences are mystical experiences. But the thing that makes them believable is that they are also, in some sense, conversion experiences, because true mystical experiences involve the change. And you can use your key terms there, going from a sick soul to being someone with a new zest for life and a moral purpose, all that kind of thing. So he would say, this shows these experiences are authentic. They're real experiences because uh, people aren't making them up. They can't be making them up because um, they're changing their lives. However, we know the response to this, right? Just because they're authentic in the sense that they're not made up, that doesn't mean they necessarily come from God. You can do a bit of nuance in there. James admitted this, even though he liked the idea, you know, he seemed to be on the side of the idea that they come from God. He ultimately set notes that. The idea that they come from God is simply uh, what he calls a reasonable hypothesis. There are other explanations. It, it doesn't not necessarily that they come from God. And then you can use Bertrand Russell. Bertrand Russell's point is just because you know fictional stories can change people's lives doesn't mean they're real. Okay, so then you've got your major two scholars. You've got Otto, linked with Swinburne and criticised. You've got James as pragmatism, criticised. Then your last one, I would just do an alternative explanation. So this is when you look at, look at say, okay, well, here's an explanation of where they might come from if they don't come from God. You know, you, you could say, you know, okay, either they come from psychology, so you go for Freud, or they, they come from um, physiology, that means they come from the temporal lobes of the brain. So you either go into in depth, and I would only do one of these, you either say, we could say that mystical experiences tell us nothing about God because they come from... Um, uh, they're psychologically caused, and then you go into Freud and the Oedipus complex, and um, uh, the the way in which people uh, need an idea of God in order to uh, cope with the problems they face in the world, like death, natural disasters, and then um, how that could result in a hallucinatory psychosis. Now, in a way. You might say that mystical experiences, compared to other forms of experiences like visions, uh, are easier to explain for Freud because you don't actually have to have like a full blown uh, hallucination of like seeing God in front of you because they're much more vague. It's just kind of a sense of the presence of God. So you could say 
from a psychological point of view, they're probably the easier to explain than some other kinds of experiences because they're so such a vague feeling. You know, it seems like the brain has to do a lot of work to cause a vision of God, but it probably doesn't have to do as much work to cause you to feel a sense of God's presence. And then, of course, you can criticise Freud and, and so on by saying he, he lacks evidence for his suggestion. If you're going down the, the physiology route, you can talk about... Um, uh, temporal lobe epilepsy and the work of Michael Persinger and then you can criticise from there could it be that all people who who have mystical experience, numerous experiences are suffering from epilepsy could it be that they're all having some kind of stimulation to the temporal lobe of the brain when you look at Michael Persinger's work, obviously it's been criticised and it's, people who've tried to you know reproduce it have failed to reproduce it so all of those things make uh, make them make there be some problems there. So at the end, in the end, you've just got to kind of um, give some kind of conclusion. Do mystical experiences prove there's a god? And I think the easiest route to go down is to say, you know, that that James seems to have a the best. His pragmatism seems to raise a very interesting point, and that is people do seem to have these mystical experiences, and they they they're probably not lying about them uh, because. Uh, they're changing their life they're making some big change to their life however it's more up in the air what they what those mystical experiences represent you know we've got other explanations it could be that they're just a kind of natural response to the world like an, as an atheist might say like using that jca gaskin stuff to say well atheists just look at the world they're amazed it's um it's full of awe and wonder and so on and so on and that's just a natural thing it could be that they're caused by psychological or physiological causes. Probably what I would end up with say, saying is that maybe um, uh, uh, William James is right, that God would be a reasonable hypothesis to explain these experiences, but the point is, it's not the only hypothesis. So my nuanced kind of conclusion would some, probably be somewhere in the ballpark of, well, mystical experiences might tell us something about the existence of God, but we can't be sure. We can't be definite what they tell us because there are other explanations of what, where these mystical experiences come from. Okay, I hope that helps. I don't know if the Stephen King stuff is just confusing or not, but hey, it was something different. Well.